Do you want to escape the nine to five? Or do you want the freedom to work when you want, where you want, and with whom you want? The Art of Passive Income podcast explores opportunities for you to achieve total freedom so you can live life on your own terms. And now, here is your host, Mark Podolsky from The Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky from The Land Geek, your favorite and achieve real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's going to be a special podcast. We're actually going to mix it up a bit and provide all of you land geekers a taste of the best of the best segments of our roundtable podcast, which have been immensely popular. So sit back with a latte or an espresso or an Americano or some kind of caffeinated drink, maybe a bulletproof coffee like me, and enjoy the best of the best of our roundtable segments. All right. Thanks so much. Happy, healthy, prosperous New Year. It's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And we've got a special roundtable podcast episode. So this week, we're going to take a look back at some of our top roundtable episodes from 2021. Now, up first is how to start a successful land business with only $10,000 in 2021. Now, if the land geeks were to start all over, how would they build their businesses differently than today? I'm really excited for you to review this podcast. It was one of our most downloaded and most popular podcasts of 2021. Enjoy. Mike Zana, what was the topic for this week's roundtable? Right. So I believe it was if you had $10,000 in capital and you were to start the business today, what would you do? I don't know if it would, you know, what would you do differently? Well, just if, I guess if any of us were to start right now, day one, 10 grand, what do you do? Okay. So Scott Bossman, I'm giving you a suitcase like Billy Rogers of $10,000. What are you going to do with it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, for me, I want to make that investment move as quickly as possible. I want my I want a return on my investment as quickly as possible. And I also want not only a return on my monetary investment, but a return on my time. So I think a return on time invested. So I am going to invest in some training. Now there's, you know, there's different degrees of training. You, you can start out small. You can start out, you know, take the leap and go into flight school with Scott Todd. But I'm going to do something to educate myself because I don't want to bootstrap this on my own and have to put together this really large jigsaw puzzle by myself and waste a lot of time and energy when I know there are experts out there that have answers. Uh, so I would do, I would do a little bit of both. I would, I would, you know, uh, put some of those funds toward training and some of those funds toward obviously the startup costs in the business and $10,000, man, that's, that's a, it's a great number to get started if you have $10,000. Um, so that's what I would do. I do a hybrid, hybrid approach, I guess. Hybrid approach. I love it. I love it. Zen master. So I'm going to assume for this question that the person has already engaged in training or is engaging in training. So now they have this $10,000 nest egg to work with. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, other than picking an area where I'm going to invest, I would engage a mailing campaign. I'd make sure that I had LG pass and my law was connected and I would start a mailing campaign and I would probably target properties because You know, now that I've fallen in love with uh, metrics such as yield, and you look at like a thousand dollar property that sells for three thousand, it's a at a hundred dollar a month payment. That's a sweet little spot there. So I would target properties uh, that were worth three to four thousand, and I would start mailing to them because I know I'd have enough money to buy uh, quite a few of those to get going. And um, so I think, yeah, I would. I think it comes down to sort of you know choosing where you're going to work, and that part of that is always the price point, right? So when I started out. I didn't have ten thousand. I had some. I had negative. I still had to invest some money or whatever. I you know I had to scrape together. But I focused on properties that were like three or four hundred dollars because I knew I could wholesale them and double my money. But if I had that ten thousand, then I would not necessarily start out with wholesale. I I really didn't have a choice sort of at the beginning. So wholesale was sort of forced upon me as an option to create cash. But I would go for the terms deals and I would 
focus on acquisitions, probably around a thousand dollars a property. Okay. Okay. Taria putting in the reps, Harris, how about you? Um, after that amazing uh, Wealth Without Wall Street module, I think I would deploy mine there into an infinite banking system and then gradually, you know, use my money to make more money. Um, but I think that's where I would start uh, based on, you know, what I'm learning about it and I am still learning about it. Um, it's one way for you to take what you have and keep what you have while leveraging what you have in your business. So that's probably what I would do with 10 K now, after going through training, I would, I would reach out to the wealth without wall street guys. As Einstein likes to say, the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. I like that. I like that. Um, Eric, the technician Peterson, 10 grand. What are you doing? Yeah. So I think I was, I was thinking along the same lines as Mike, you know, um, get a mailing out, target some properties in that kind of thousand dollar price range. Um, I like the returns on those, but I think I would incorporate maybe some wholesaling in conjunction with some retail sales. Um, so that I don't run out of money. If, if that 10,000 is, is my investment, um, I want to make sure I've still got funds to buy more land once that's um, purchased. So by wholesaling a couple, I can regain some capital. And then probably around, you know, month three or four or five, somewhere in there, after I've got some season notes, um, I would start thinking about selling off some of those notes to regain some capital and get it, pour it right back into the business to buy more land. Um, so basically whatever I could do to allow myself to continue buying more land is, is going to be my strategy. So I don't want to just go buy 10, $1,000 properties and sell them all on terms and have to wait for my, my capital to come back to me. Um, I want to use some methods to, to help get that back quicker and be able to deploy more money. I love it. I love it. Um, Tate, I love it when you call me big Papa Litchfield. 10 grand. It, it's a good uh, amount of money to bring to the table, honestly. You've got a lot of options with it. Uh, one of the things I would do is I'd mail, obviously. I'd set aside some money for acquisitions from the direct mailer, and then I'd look at wholesale and maybe land arbitrage or something like that. My goal with that $10,000 would be put as many properties in my inventory as quickly as possible. Um, you got to own land to sell land and the more property you control, the more opportunities you'll have to, uh, to, to make sales. And then once I got a bunch of sales, I would look at, uh, selling some notes, partials for sure. Okay. Um, Scott Todd. Well, and this is why it's hard to go last too, right? You know, Mike, Mike saying this is why it's hard to go first. And here's why it's hard to go last is because all of these ideas have kind of been put out there. And I was thinking like, okay, Tate, don't take this one. Don't take mine or Eric, don't take mine, but they did. So here's what I would do. First of all, I did start my business with $10,000 of capital, right? So, you know, this is a number that's, uh, that, that I connect with. Now that didn't include my training. It was my capital. So, you know, I, I kind of, you, you kind of have to decide, you know, education, not education, however you're going to do it. You got to have some education in order to do this. But here's what I would do is I would allocate around $2,000 towards uh, mailing. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say, look, I'm going to, in mailing cost is what I'm saying, right? Like I'm going to, that's, that's like four months worth of mailing. I'm going to allocate that just to give myself some time frame. So I'm going to start my mailing campaign. Well, that leaves me $8,000 of money. I'm going to take half of that money, $4,000 of the eight, and I'm going to um, hold some of that for my mailing pieces. Okay, so I'm going to go hold some of that for my mailing pieces. That leaves me with $4,000. So I got $4,000 that, that when my mail comes back, I can buy land, and I got $2,000 going to my mail, I'm at six. So I got $4,000 remaining. I'm taking 10, I'm sorry, I'm taking $1,000 and I'm calling my buddy Tate up and I'm going to say, Tate, 
tell me the land that you have that I can arbitrage from you. And he's gonna give me a list of all the properties that he can arbitrage, that I can arbitrage, maybe as low as $100. I'm gonna try to get some land for like $100 down. Land arbitrage means that I, Tate's gonna own the land. I'm basically gonna buy it from him on terms. I'm gonna pay him $100 down and whatever per month. So 100 bucks a month or whatever. I'm gonna take 10 of those, 10. So I'm gonna take 10 of them right now. It's $1,000 over to Tate. That leaves me with $3,000. And then I'm gonna call the other land coaches or buddies in the community, friends in the community. I'm gonna say, what do you have wholesale? And I'm gonna spend $3,000 on wholesale. Now, what I just did was I probably ended up with maybe three properties through wholesale, 10 through land arbitrage. I've got 13 properties under my control now. I have mailings going out and I have um, money to buy, $4,000 worth to buy. And then what I would do is when I sold these things on terms, would sell them on terms or cash because about 25% of all the deals are cash deals. So knowing that I'm gonna generate some cash there, I'm gonna, if it's if it's a cash on a land arb deal, I'm gonna pay off Tate or whoever is holding it. I'm gonna pay them off. I'm gonna have pure profit now and I'm just gonna put it all right back in. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sell the notes where I can, like Eric said, uh, to generate cash today to keep the mailings or to go buy more land art, right? So I would do. Wow, this is this is a really interesting topic. Um, we can call it the ten thousand dollar tapestry, because if you take everything what everybody said, you've got this beautiful, uh, you know, philosophy of of what to do with the money. Now, I personally, um, I like what everybody said, but I really like what Scott Boston said in the very beginning, which was, I'm going to focus on how can I save myself time. With the philosophy, I can always give myself money. So I'm going to combine Taria's philosophy with Scott Bossman's philosophy. So I'm going to go to Landon, Taria's husband, and say, because I know Landon's got 10 grand sitting in the bank at 0% interest. And so I say, Landon, I'm going to borrow 10 grand from you at 10%. And he's like, okay, no problem. Or he's like, yeah, um, I can borrow it from my life insurance policy. So I make an infinite return on my money while that 3% keeps compounding in my infinite banking policy. So now I'm leveraging Landon. Now I'm taking that $10,000 um, that I have. It's just, I'm putting that somewhere else, maybe another policy or, or something as collateral for Landon. So Landon knows worst case, I have the cash, right? But I'm going to use his money at 10%. Now I'm going to just utilize everybody else's, um, you know, tactics. I'm going to buy wholesale. I'm going to land ARB. Um, I'm going to watch my capital, but I'm really going to start growing at this exponential level now because after I pay back Landon, he's like, I don't want the money back. Keep it. Let's just keep rolling this thing. And now I can grow even faster. Then I'm, you know, we didn't even talk about it, but I'm hiring VAs at landva4u.com. Um, I'm getting into LG Pass and GeekPay. I'm using software. So now I'm using other people's money, other people's time, and um, in, in, uh, in the software. So all three points of leverage. Tate Litchfield, what do you think? I think the main takeaway for me here is that people are moving their feet, right? It doesn't really matter which one of these approaches you take as long as you do something, right? If you are serious about this, prove it, right? If you believe that this will work for you and if you've heard enough from other people who are having success, what's holding you back, right? I always tell people that this is a great line of work in because if you buy these properties, you know, at 20 cents on the dollar, 25 percent, 30 cents on the dollar, it's impossible to lose money, right? If you're working in the right areas, you've done proper accounting research because you can always move them to somebody else. I'll buy them. I'll buy you out on it, right? You might not make a ton of money, but I'll take it off your hands. So I, I really liked what everyone said about just moving their feet. You just take an action. That was my takeaway from boot camp too, is do it. Don't wait. Right, for right. This. Yeah. And let's say like, you, I love what you said, but like, let's say that I'm a newbie. Sure. And I've never Absolutely. done a deal. Would Landon allow, would Landon borrow, let me borrow $10,000? Well, 
Well, if I can say to him, hey, I graduated from flight school, so I've got, you know, intellectual capital here that I've borrowed from a guy who's done, you know, over 2,000 deals from. There's no way I can lose. This is the strategy. I've been trained to do this. And I've got the 10,000 set aside for your collateral. I think he would do it. I don't know. Well, Eric 10 Peterson? G's is nothing for him. And 10 G's is nothing for Landon. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I love it. I think, you know, hitting the ground running um, is the only way to make progress, right? I mean, you, you have to start doing something. Um, if someone's going to give you or loan you an amount of money, you better have a plan in place. And that involves moving forward, taking the next step. Yeah. Tria, what are your final thoughts? Um, I... I like, I like what you said, the tapestries. I think everyone had a great strategy, but I also like that none of the strategies involved, like let's say you don't have $10,000. Well, Scott Todd broke his down into manageable pieces. Like, well, I'd take a thousand, I'd go get some land art. So there are even manageable chunks within the 10,000 if you don't have it, that you can still start doing something with. Yeah, I mean, I start with 3,000. Um, Kate, you started with what? Five, five thousand. Five, five, five thousand. Eric. Eric, you started with five thousand. Mike Zano started in the negative forty thousand. Um, Scott Boston, what did you start with? Uh, we, I gave myself five thousand dollars. Five thousand. So you you don't even need ten thousand. Ten thousand is like a nice luxury to have, mm -hmm. um, for sure. I think we, we did a, a round table on this, like even a thousand dollars, you can you start doing deals um, and flipping them. You can do, I mean, land are easy, but even a wholesale deal, you could do it. And just, you know, there's, there's so much that, that can be gained from just going full cycle on the buying and selling on a deal. That confidence I think is priceless. And, and certainly that that's the best investment you can make really is just knowing that this works for you. And then if you can do it once, you can do it a million times. This next round table episode covers the do's and don'ts of wholesaling with our resident wholesaling expert, Mike Zano, and the rest of the Land Geek team. Now, I'm not going to speak in a Boston accent because I don't want to offend the Bostonians here, but Mike is wicked smart. All right, fine. I did it. Enjoy one of the most popular roundtable podcasts from 2021. What are some of the do's and don'ts of wholesaling? Do's and don'ts. Okay. Well, first off, I would say that uh, don't try to sell wholesale retail. I think that happens quite a bit. I think people um, try to bump their prices up, which is understandable. They want to make a profit. But listen, I don't always double my money on wholesale. Um, but I do make money on wholesale and, you know, especially when I do multiple properties, like when I, if I buy like 20 or 30 or more, I've bought, in, uh, up, you know, we all have like 50, hundred properties at once. And then you negotiate a really good price, but, but still, if you have that many properties, I don't, if I'm, if it's one transaction and I'm making, you know, four or $500 per property and let's say I got 10 of them, that's five grand quick, you know, I don't have to double my money. So I think that, um, my first rule would be that don't try to gouge people because if you're going to wholesale, you're going to want to probably continue to wholesale and your customer base is going to get real small. Um, I do enjoy, I mean, does it sting? No. I hear that we go into the boot camps and people are like, yeah, I made, the, I think it was Kevin Sue. I made the best, <laughs> like all of this yield or his uh, ROI was insane. And that was a wholesale that I bought from Mike. So it doesn't bother me though. It really does it because I know he'll come back and buy more, right? And I made money on that deal too, right? Maybe I could have made some more. That's okay. I'll know that next time, Kevin. But you know, uh, I think that's the first uh, rule I'd say, Mark. Don't gouge people. Don't gouge people. Scott Bossman, the nightcap OG. Do you want to riff on that as well? What What are some wholesale do's and don'ts you you see in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think to to expand upon what Mike said, you have to be fair, you know, you know uh, in our community, right? If if you want to be a long 
I mean, this is not, not a threat, obviously, but to be a long-standing good member of this community, right? You want to be fair. You want to Sounds come like across as fair. You want to make sure there's enough meat on the bone for everybody. I, I would say also when you're when you uh, come to the table with some wholesale property, you do need to give good information. I think uh, the more information you give, the quicker you're going to sell it. I think uh, if you have a due diligence report, I think that's great. Uh, I think if you have some pictures, I think that's great. I don't think you need uh, actual pictures of the property, maybe some aerial screenshots, that type of thing. But if you come to the table with a little bit of information like that, uh, I think that's going to really uh, be an appropriate thing uh, when you're selling. And then um, I touched on this a little bit last week, but I think uh, it's kosher to not uh, uh, charge a doc fee on wholesale deals in our community. Um, I mean, really, what does the doc fee do? It re recoups some of our costs, right? Our marketing costs, uh, that type of thing, our mailing costs. But um, really, uh, you, can, you can take a property and sell it wholesale the next day in our group. And there's not a lot of work uh, that, that took place there. So uh, I don't think the, the, the need for recouping costs is there on wholesale deals. Uh, therefore, I think the doc fee uh, would be something I would, I would definitely stay away from when I'm trying to sell to somebody else. Barry Peterson, what would, what would you say if somebody tried to charge you a doc fee on a wholesale deal? Um, I think I'd tell them that uh, I'm not buying that property if they're going to charge me a doc fee. Have you ever charged a doc fee in a wholesale deal? Absolutely You're on, not. You're on mute. Well, my, wait, my, oh, you were asking yeah. me, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Have you no, ever charged I, I, anybody, anybody no a doc, doc fee? fee? But sometimes I've advised people that, are, you know, they haven't dealt with another investor before. They could say, listen, I'm going to, you know, get a, a geek pay down payment lane for $100. It's not a dog fee. It's going to come off the total price, but it, it's a good faith payment to sort of have the deed and all that created. So um, it's not a dog fee, but it could serve in, as in a similar fashion because we want we don't want to create documents wholesale or retail without some money in our hands because we all know people ghost us. And uh, so not a doc fee mark but in similar um sort of strategy i guess but it comes off a total price great so Eric peterson when you're when you're dealing with a, a wholesaler you know just to riff on what scott and mike said what what else if anything would you also be looking for well i'm going to give an example today i had a a recent wholesale transaction which um I will probably not go back to that person to purchase wholesale again because of the way the transaction was done. Um, there are a couple things to note about what happened in that transaction. Um, typically, um, it would be my expectation that when I'm buying wholesale from another investor, and unless otherwise noted, I'm going to get the properties on a warranty deed. Um, I think that's kind of what we kind of teach in the community. That's the expectation that's out there. Um, in this particular case, the uh, seller sold me the properties on a special warranty deed without ever telling me. Um, so that was problem one. Uh, the second problem was they didn't record the deed. They gave me the deed and expected me to record it. I just, I've never dealt with a wholesaler that worked like that. I would never do that. Um, but that's the way this person worked. Now, admittedly, they were not um, probably the most experienced land investor and maybe not a member of our community. But nonetheless, um, you know, I'm not going to work with somebody that treats me as a wholesale buyer like that. I think that it's reasonable to expect when you're buying wholesale from a wholesaler, the number one, uh, if it's not a warranty deed, they're going to tell you about it beforehand. And number two, they're going to record the document for you and complete the documents for you. Um, this is this particular transaction ha happened to be in a state where there was a state specific form um, and they didn't complete that form. I had to do that too. So it was just all this extra stuff um, the deal was good enough. I was, I was just going to move forward with it anyways, but I won't be going back because of all those things that came up. You know, I had that happen to me once because just like you said, 
I'm not going back. Um, it's just, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Um, Tate, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I mean, I don't think I've, I've had people who asked me to record a deed on behalf of the transaction because maybe they didn't have access to simply file or something like that. And I said, yeah, no problem. I'll take it out of the, the, the amount that, you know, I typically would have paid you for the property and, and that's totally fine. But to have somebody kind of leave you waiting and hanging around, I mean, that's just, it's just not cool. And I think the important thing to remember about working with wholesale is you're working with a colleague, right? Like you're working with somebody who you hope to work with many more times in the future. I've done deals with everybody on this call. And the one thing that I like about working with Mike is if he sends me a list, because he and I have developed a relationship, if I say, I'll take them, he doesn't really need to worry about it because I told him, hey, they're mine, I'm buying them, right? And, you know, that's because we've developed a, a rapport and a relationship. And if I was working with somebody I didn't know, I say, you know, hey, secure the property. I need to know that you're serious because paperwork and all of that goes into my team. But with Mike, no, nah, he doesn't make me do that because he knows the check's gonna come, right? Um, and I think that's just good etiquette. Uh, you know, things that I look for when doing wholesale deals, I mean, I ask everybody, hey, is there anything fishy with these properties, right? Are they going to come on a special warranty? Deal? I don't ask that specifically, but I would expect that to be, you know, told to me up front. The other thing I want to know is, hey, any liens back taxes owed? No? Okay, fine. And it comes down to who you work with. If you trust the person you work with, like, we're all human. We've all missed things. Um, but the good thing is if you work with somebody who you trust and they come to you and say, look, there's a mistake, this property's not uh, what we thought it was, they're going to tell you, here's your money back or let me fix it. No problem. I bought a property recently and the property was recorded into our name and it turns out that uh, the death certificate from the previous buyer didn't get recorded in the right sequence. And so we own it with a dead guy. Well, I called the previous guy who sold us the property and they said, my bad, I'll take care of it. And uh, they emailed me and said, look, we got it resolved. You're good to go. And that's why you work wholesale, right? You wanna work with somebody who says, my bad, mea culpa, let me take care of this. No hard feelings. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that sounds very Zeno-esque, but I could be wrong. It could be another wholesaler. Uh, and no, Mike's Mike's good. His his properties are right. But I mean, I've bought property from lots of people and it's like, oh, we made a mistake on the legal description. We made a mistake on the APN, whatever. As long as they fix it, it doesn't negatively, you know, impact my relationship with them by any means. Yeah. You know, you know, what we should talk about, Tate. What's that? I mean, is is how great we are to work with as wholesale buyers. Like we're kind of like, these are the do, do's and don'ts of wholesale. What makes a good buyer? You know what makes a good buyer? Somebody who's got money right now. <laughs> right now, we're ready to go right now. We know exactly We know exactly the questions to ask and we can close right away. There's no waiting, you know. Well, I mean, you know that, that money's good. Time, you know, money loves speed, right? And if you can call somebody up and say, hey, Mike, I know you want 500 a lot, but I'm going to give you 450 and the checks in the mail tonight. He's going to say, do you have the right address? Right. That's the only way he's going to respond to that question because I'm buying all of it. Right. And he knows that if I, I say I want it, then the money's coming. So yeah, you want to work with people who aren't going to beat you up too much. And it's a, it's a painless transaction. Yeah. Yeah. So Scott Todd, what's on all of this? You know, the, uh, I, I was going to ask, like, why, why is the person selling the property wholesale? Why do they have to record the deed, right? Like, man, you're getting it a good deal. And obviously, I think Eric kind of talked on that, right? Like, it's just the normal standard. Typically, whoever sells the property is the one who records the deed. That's just the way that it is. One thing I would think that would also just word of caution, like, if you're going to buy land wholesale, this is something that like I see this happen all the time is you get in such a hurry because you want to buy the land. You're like someone sends out like, I don't know, a list. Zeno sends out a list and you're like, you know what? I want it all. And Mike's like, well, OK, no problem, because, you know, he has no reason to doubt you. And then all of a sudden you start going, well, wait a minute. 
wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What exactly can I do on this property? Like you did no due diligence in advance. You don't know anything about the area. You just saw something and you're like, I want it. And then you want to go and ask a million questions. Well, look, I get it. Okay. Like I understand that, but you know what? There are people that like work in these areas who know them. Like you say, Hey, this is, this is the property. And they're like, Oh yeah, I sell this all the time. Great. Now I'm not saying that you're wrong for, for jumping in and buying it, but before you do that, you might want to research and do a little bit of advanced due diligence, some county research. You want to know what you're doing. Don't just jump on a wholesale deal because, because you think it's not going to come. Land offers and deals, they come all the time. They're like the bus. So, you know, use, use some time. Understand what you're getting yourself into before you jump in and make a payment. And then you want to say, well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is wrong because it look the way that the credit card companies work and the way this stuff time is money. And if, if I have to issue you a refund, well, I'm not happy about issuing a refund. Not because, not because I lost out on the money. Cause I'll resell the land. You know, what drives me crazy about the refunds is that now they keep the merchant fee. So whenever I have to give someone a refund, I'm like out 20 bucks or 30 bucks. You do that a couple times and man, that's a, that's a meal. Well, okay. It's a few meals, depending on where you eat. It's a few donuts. A few, do, listen, few donuts. A dollar six a day, man. That's a lot of donuts. Yeah. But I, Scott, I think what you're bringing up is a great point because as a, as a buyer, um, I remember back in the day I was, I was that buyer that would feel a tremendous amount of pressure to take down the entire deal because I didn't want Eric Peterson swooping in, right? So I didn't do enough due diligence. I felt a lot of pressure. I'm nervous writing the check. And sure enough, after I own it, I start finding all the flaws. Oh, and so the only reason I, I had to buy it so fast in, in such an undisciplined way was out of fear. And you never make a good decision ever in life, whether it's land or anything in an emotional state. When you, if you feel rushed, that's, that should be a red flag. Hey, prob I'm, I'm probably not the buyer for this. And if your wholesaler is and saying, you've got 24 hours to make this, so many other people interested in it, and you don't want to take those 24 hours and you feel pressure, just say, pass, I'm not the person for this. Come back to me when I have a, a little bit more time to do proper due diligence. And I think that's a don't in the selling world, world is don't be the person that pressures the buyers. Even if you have a whole queue of people ready to buy, they're not going anywhere. Give people the proper time to do proper due diligence so they want to work with you again. What do you think, Zeno? Yes, I, I think that's really important uh, uh, and a good point because and that's just not for wholesale mark. There's times where you might have a retail buyer giving you that sort of pressure. And the, the more, the sooner you embrace the fact that there's no shortage of land out there, that there's isn't the word infinite isn't probably applicable, but there's, there's so many deals. You're not going to feel pressured by one, no matter how sweet it sounds. There's, there's always another one that, you know, um, I like to say, you know, that, you know, someone started uh, five years ago, you know, someone's talked to me about, I guess it's sort of a related subject to about an area that's really busy by a lot of investors. I said, well, listen, someone who started five years ago is there has made a million dollars. Someone who's going to start in five years is going to make a million dollars there. It's never, the opportunity is never going to go away. So don't feel pressured by these deals. Uh, so pass a mark on a deal because of feeling a pressure on time constraint. Yeah, absolutely. Don't, there's no shortage out there. Well, uh, uh, yeah. So any last final words of wisdom, Mike Zeno, as a wholesaler on the do's and don'ts? I, I, I will. I think that, Mark, I think that sometimes people will move towards wholesale because it, they're having some difficulty with their marketing. And rather than dig deep into their marketing, they, they find the quick out, which is the wholesale. Now, I needed the wholesale because uh, I was in debt and so on and so forth. Um, I have a business, a separate, it's not my particular LLC. I have one with a friend. We do wholesale. It's just easier for us to do cash deals. But 
Um, I wouldn't just gravitate. I, I talk to a lot of people because they know I did wholesale and they want to do wholesale. And my advice is you know, uh, go for the terms. Don't, don't just wholesale because you feel like you're having a hard time marketing because uh, you know, that, that takes a, it's a skill to develop just like buying the property was a skill you developed. So I would say, don't go there too quick, quickly because you feel like you're not getting traction on retail, dig your heels in uh, the retail sales will come. So I think that's important. I think that's actually a whole other roundtable discussion is what is your heuristic when to wholesale a property as right. opposed to when to retail it. So thank you, Mike Zano. We've got a, a whole new topic for next week. And it's on transcript. Fantastic. And it's on the transcript. <laughs> All right, I'm back to break in again and introduce our final roundtable episode which was super duper popular because it comes from Land Geek alum Roberto Chavez. And a lot of you even discovered Land Geek from Roberto's interview with Nick Loper inside Hustle Nation. So this was one of the most downloaded, most popular podcasts of 2021. And if you're not familiar with Roberto, he re recently retired from his career as a lawyer to pursue land full time and enjoy. Today's guest is Roberto Chavez. We're all wearing our retirement hats because let's just let Roberto tell us the story. Roberto, the round table is yours. <laughs> Mark, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Uh, it's been a while since we haven't seen each other in person, but yeah, I sent you a, a Vox a couple of weeks ago announcing uh, my official retirement from the law profession. And so uh, as of last Tuesday, last Tuesday was my last day at the firm. Um, it's, uh, it's been a lot of emotions, all good emotions, but it's, it's, been, it's been a wild ride, uh, to say the least. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm extremely excited about all the doors that are going to be open with all this time and putting more time into the land business and, and, and being more of the CEO of this, of this business. So I'm, I'm super excited. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, we've talked about this, but I'll just say it publicly how, how proud I am. All of us are Tate, especially as your, as your, you know, head coach in, in coaching. And, um, it's, it's really why we do what we do. Um, and then we get to celebrate, the the result of that and in you're just beginning you're still just a baby in the land business <laughs> and you know but now instead of crawling you're walking and uh tate remember the uh, and scott remember in tampa the first boardroom with roberto yeah and uh and you know he's like i'm working too much and it was like i, th I think at that point roberto were you well, how many hours a week were you working in the business uh, probably 20 or something like that, between 20, 25, maybe, but, but I don't know that they were the most efficient 20 to 25 hours. Uh, but I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that my head was also at the firm and, you know, you're trying to juggle two, two, two big responsibilities at the same time. And it, it makes it a little bit more difficult to really focus in on, on the business and, and make the time work better for you. All right. Well, let's go around because I know we've got questions for you. So let's start with, and he loves when he goes first, the captain, <laughs> the Zen master, Mike Zan. So Mike, first of all, tell us why you're not wearing the retired hat. Well, I still work at the fire department, much to uh, your dismay, I know. And, and, you know, I would be retiring early, but my son, Josh, just got on the job. And it's sort of a it's a legacy thing, right? You want to work with your son, uh, maybe have a few fires together and so on and so forth. So um, it's coming soon. I have the hat. I looked at it. It was like, it's like, it's in the, I know the moment I pull it out, it's going to be very emotional. Uh, so that's why, but I chose to wear my, uh, you know, my, the hat that I have in honor of Scott Todd and all the wisdom from flight school. 
my captain, my pilot hat. I don't know if this is really what a pilot hat looks like, but it is, it is, this is a form of admiration when I wear this. I know that he sometimes take it, takes it differently, but truly uh, he has been one of the biggest impacts of my life and my business. So I, this is actually meant to celebrate that. Okay. I like how you started your introduction introduction by, you know, kissing up to Scott Todd there. That was really <laughs> classy, Mike. Listen, that I've been on the other classy. side of that equation and I'm not going back. <laughs> but <laughs> this is Roberto. So Roberto, first of all, congratulations. Uh it's been amazing to watch uh you excel in this business. You know, um, I know you said a little bit about your story, but I don't know, is there what, what maybe would be some pivotal points in the land business for you or maybe like a huge obstacle that you overcame that, you know, what was the moment when you knew this was going to be life changing? Uh, it's, it's, it's strange because it, it really was when I did my first deal, um, when, when I did my first deal and I proved to myself that I could buy a piece of land for 500 bucks and then turn around and sell it for $6,000, $7,000. That to me was was life changing in, in in the way I thought about making money and and another way of making money. And so the the moment I did that first sale for me, it was uh, it was kind of like, what the heck? Why didn't anybody tell me about this before? Like I've been going to school and 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 uh, getting a job and and. And here I am making on one sale what I make in a month or something like that. It, it's it, it was it really changed the way I thought about the way a person can make money and make a living. And so that that to me was like that. I it, there was no stopping me from the moment I made that first sale and I proved to myself that I could do this business. It was just looking ahead and never looked back. All right. Well, great answer. Yeah, there's a big difference between hearing about the sales we do and then actually participating in one, right? That that proof of concept is is enormous. Yeah, no, no. And once you do it once, I mean, you know, you can do it 100 times, 200 times, 1000 times. I mean, it's just a matter of doing it that one time. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Dude, buddy. Nightcap OG. What is your question for Roberto? Uh well, Roberto, congratulations. I'm really, really excited for you. Um, you're one of the first person I ever talked to, first people I've ever talked to uh, when I started doing some outreach calls for Mark. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, but I guess my question for you is, you know, we all know you're a top performer. I mean, look at what you've done in, in three, four years. So what, what characteristics set you apart from maybe somebody else who, uh, decided it wasn't for them or somebody else maybe is going a little bit slower uh, or somebody who maybe isn't having the experience they want to yet. So what, what sets you apart? What characteristics do you have that, that made this happen? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, Scott. You were like the, the, the one that opened the gates uh, to this business for me. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of that as well, because you, you were the first person that I talked to and you kind of uh, opened up my eyes as to what this business was uh, after hearing Mark on the podcast that, that I first heard him on and, and you were you were very helpful in giving me that that little extra push that I needed so for for that thank you um, I, I, I honestly don't know and I don't think I have any special skill uh, that anybody else would lack I mean I like I I think it was more the the drive and the desire, and I think if if somebody has the drive and the desire, and and really the passion to get out of the eight to five and just start doing their own thing, as long as you've got that skill, or it's not even a skill, it's probably just a, a that burning desire. As long as you have that, you'll be able to acquire any skill that you need to be successful in this business. So. I think people don't make it in this business just because they probably lack that that true desire to to kind of free themselves from the from the eight to five and start living off this business. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I love that, and you know, I'm just going to jump on the the Mike Zeno bandwagon here and and kiss up to Scott Todd for a moment because you know he gets that question a lot. Um, the, you know, because I think he, Scott, you set did, did you set the record? It was seventeen months, three days, to replace your Fortune 
50 income or whatever it was or wait you're on mute or... sorry yeah that's that's true i know people have done it faster than this today which is no problem uh, i think it's really cool when they do that um but yeah i mean you know i think that that's really the, the whole goal is to make it make the whole thing move faster right 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 but you you know you're always talking about that that burning desire people ask me you know what what separates you know somebody who's successful from unsuccessful first of all i don't think there's anything such thing as unsuccessful it, you're going to learn something you're going to grow either way but i definitely think that you know in, in like conventionally speaking if your destination is i want to quit my job i want to replace my income i want to retire my spouse whatever that is i always say it's grit the ability to you know get back up when times are tough and um but I think that without that burning desire, that big why, as the core fundamental principle, you won't have grit. You won't get back up. And so um, I, I'm really glad that you, you spoke to that, Roberto, because, um, you know, it, I, I would have just, you know, been like, oh, no, if you're like, yeah, it's because I have a legal background. <laughs> no, there's that's that's. That's just a little tool in the toolbox that that helps with the business, but that that's not really gonna. I mean, if that were the case, there would be a bunch of attorneys doing this business if they were the the key to success in this in this business, and and that's that's not it at all. All right, let's go to the technician, Eric Peterson. All right, so. As everybody has said, congratulations, Roberto. We're glad to see you at this point. You've you've done really well in the land business, and and that's impressive. Um, I'm sure that in your career you had to wear a suit or at least a shirt and tie every day. So I want to know what are you going to do with all those? Are you going to sell them on eBay? Or <laughs> I mean, you don't have to wear that stuff anymore. Yeah, I don't know good. what I'm going to do. It's uh. It's an extra wardrobe there that I, I don't know what, what, what I can, it's for sale if anybody here wants it. <laughs> maybe maybe you know. could raise enough to buy a piece of land. Yeah, you never know. That'd be, that'd be pretty ironically cool to sell all the suits <laughs> and buy some land with that. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'll just be saving them for weddings and stuff where I actually have to suit up again. Um but I don't know what I'm going to do with that. It takes up some space, so I I, I need to get rid of some of it. But it feels it it, it felt nice when uh, I I was actually picking up some ties because I I went to a wedding two weeks ago, and I was like I I don't think I had really thought about the fact that I'm I'm not going to have to worry about picking ties for for work anymore. And it's uh it's a pretty cool feeling. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let me ask a, a real question. So. Um, you know, I think something that uh, that we hear a lot from from people just coming into the the land um, world, if you will, is you know there's there's this concern or this um, you know fear of well, if I buy this piece of land, you know, I might make a mistake. Something could go wrong. So so talk to us about maybe a mistake you made made along the way and. I'm sure you were able to solve it if you did. So, so give us a little story there. Yeah. So I, I think the, the biggest quote unquote land mistake that I had uh, in the land business was buying land out in a county, out in the middle of nowhere um, from a buyer that sold another piece of property where I do buy. And so I just had to hold on to that property for a very, very long time. I'm talking about probably close to two years that I just, had it on me um, and it took a while, but it eventually sold as well. But it, it was just kind of on, on the back burner of my inventory. And I, I really wasn't uh, too focused on, on selling. I didn't have a good buyer's list for that property. It was just uh, kind of in the back of my mind. Uh, and eventually I, I unloaded it with kind of a package deal with some other land, still made money off of it. But it just wasn't a, a piece of property that I was going to be working on, uh, the area I wasn't going to be working on. So it, it really didn't make sense for me to keep it. But it was kind of a newbie mistake in the sense that it was 
he offered it. It seemed like a good deal. And I just jumped on it without having really studied the, the county or, or comps or, or anything like that. But I mean, and in, in, in any other business, I think you make a mistake like that. And it, it could be pretty bad in terms of, of lost money. But in this case, it, it really, I didn't feel the impact. Awesome. All right, Taria putting in the reps Harris. Uh, congratulations, Roberto. Um, Roberto was actually one of the first people outside of uh, coaches that we spoke to um, about the land business. We met him in our first boot camp. So it's awesome to see how well you were doing then and just how much further you've come. So congrats. Thank so you. Thank now that you've retired, um, how are you kind of reallocating your time towards the business? Are you spending a little more time, you know, focusing on how to make it better? Are you spending less time? How does your retirement now, how, how has your time shifted now that you've retired? Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still working on that in terms of how I'm, I'm going to schedule my time and, and, in terms of how much time I'm going to be putting into the the, the business right now, I, I it, it's I just stopped last Tuesday, so I'm kind of in a transition mode. I'm going to be taking a, a, a pretty long trip here for for the rest of the summer. So coming <laughs> nice. back in August, that's that's <laughs> probably when when I'll 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 get my schedule in order. But right now, I'm just kind of enjoying the the. The, the flow and the, the high of, of having quit the job. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into the, the nitty gritty of the schedule probably um, in the next couple. I'll, I'll probably plan it while I'm away. I'll, I'll think about that while I'm somewhere uh, having some dreams. I'll, I'll start thinking about that. Nice. We, we can start a new site instead of where's Waldo, where's Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> So I know you're going to go to two different countries. Where where are you going again? Yeah, so we're going, Maria and I, we're going uh, all of June, well, most of June to Denmark. Um, we've got friends that live there, so we're going to go visit. We're renting an Airbnb for, for around 28 days there. And then we're going to Croatia for the month of July. And so we're just going to go chillax out there. And there's no issues with COVID and restrictions. No, Denmark is the only one that that it's right now we need to have a worthy purpose. And so our, our friends have a business over there. So if worse comes to worse, we're going to go there to have a business meeting. Um, but it looks like they are going to open it up to vaccinated U.S. citizens in the next week or so. And Croatia's open uh, to, to tourists. And so uh, Croatia's OK. Denmark is the only one that's still a little bit up in the air. But it, I think we can we'll be able to get in the way. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know, uh, you know, I don't even know how long Tate and I've been talking about you. So this is, uh, I know this is very, very personal for Tate. I love when you call me big Papa Litchfield. So Tate, the floor is yours. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm stoked to be doing this call. I haven't looked, you know, I woke up this morning and I remembered that Today's call was with Roberto, and it's been probably one of the most exciting, you know, calls that I've looked forward to in a long, long time. So it's a, uh, it's truly a great pleasure and an honor to be here talking with you today. And honestly, you know, at the end of the day, we're proud of you, man. You did it. You executed. You sat down. You set goals, and you accomplished it. So I mean, hats off to you. Well deserved. Bravo, Chapo. Like, good job, man. And. I'm excited to see kind of what the future holds for you. And that kind of lines up with my question and what's next? I mean, you've done so well over the last three years, staying focused. Are you staying focused in the raw vacant land space or are you getting shiny object syndrome and going to go dabble in other things? What, what's, what's the plan? Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, thanks Tate for, for the kind words. I mean, I, I owe a lot of this to, to you as well. You helped me focus, hyper-focus and, set those specific goals month after month for two years. Uh, and that was key to, to, to be having this conversation today. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's been kind of on the back of my mind. I've, I've been, uh, it, 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 it's 
it's a mental struggle, I guess, because I now I have more. Well, I've, I've been having more time, and then any podcast that Mark has, uh, I'll go in and try to find out more information about the guy that they had and what it is that they're doing, and and it's 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 kind of. Uh, uh, I have to pull myself back and be like, wait, wait, you don't, I mean, what are you going to do? Start all over again, retire again? Or like, well, what's the whole point here? And so I have to kind of pull myself back and say, hold on. This is, this is what you've learned. This is your bread and butter selling raw land. You need to stay focused on that. And so it's, it's a little hard because there are stuff out there that seem really attractive and, you know, sometimes you want to diversify a little bit, but, but I don't, uh, I, I think what this business has given me is way too much for me to allow myself to wander off and try to do something completely off track from this. Um, it's, it's, it's shown me too much as to what I can do. And I don't think I'm going to be letting it go uh, anytime soon. So, uh, yeah. but, but if Enjoy there is that freedom, out there, you like, spend some time with your folks and what's that? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, enjoy that freedom that you've earned, right? Like, go spend some time with the folks, go to the farm, hang out, relax. You know, you've earned it, man. Yeah, hey. no, that's that's what we're trying to do. And that's why we decided to take this little uh, little trip around that we can. Uh, it'll be hard to find another, just for both Maria and myself, a time where we can both uh, take two months off. Uh, it, it, I mean, maybe we'll have it again in two years and I'll let you guys know, but right now I'm guessing <laughs> this is going to become a yearly thing. I'm guessing, you know, <laughs> Mark started off this way. I'm going to take two weeks off. And now he's up to like what, five weeks in a row that he like is MIA and it's like a yearly thing for him. And you know what? Why not? Why not, man? Go enjoy, you know, for the record, Roberto is not a trust fund kid either. He worked hard at this and uh, he bootstrapped it for a long, long time. And so, as he said, if he can do it and I can do it and, you know, Mark can do it, anybody else can do it too. It's pretty cool. It's good stuff, man. Proud of you. Thank you, Tate. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's... got to go to dinner. Come to Vegas, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have so many thoughts, but, um, you know, Roberto, if you are struggling with the stillness, vox me. I'll help you. Because it's 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 a thing. You, you know, for, you know... I don't know. We're just, we feel badly for not doing, doing, doing. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes to just be still and just think and look at your business at the macro level and see, okay, what's the lever I can pull that's really going to make the biggest impact. It takes time. And, um, but I can help you with it. Take can help you with it. We all can help you with it. So, I'll take, uh, I'll take but it, you know, it's, it is a thing for sure. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad Tate brought up that question. All right, Scott Todd. Still can't hear you, Scott. Well, there you go. There we go. Tate, thanks uh, for stealing my question. Appreciate that, buddy. And uh, <laughs> thanks for leaving me to struggle here. Roberto, my question is simple. Are you married or engaged yet? <laughs> yeah, so we, we 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 got engaged. Maria and I got engaged uh, right before the pandemic, and then uh, so we weren't able to schedule or plan a wedding. And but we got too anxious, and so we actually got married uh, through the court system uh, back in April of this year. And we're planning our wedding for sometime next year in Mexico. So. Nice. We, nice. We just we, we we just wanted to do it already, and COVID wasn't uh, being too friendly, and we weren't sure when uh, they were gonna we were gonna be able to plan something nice. So we said, let's just do it, and then we'll do the party later on. Look, Mark, look at look at this. Okay, not only is this a retirement party, it should be a wedding party too. <laughs> look, I mean, where's my wedding hat? Uh, you know what? There's always next week, and we'll wear tuxes. <laughs> oh boy. Tria, Tria put on a, on a on a dress, a formal dress. Well, all hey, like Mark, powder blue texas, like from Dumb and Dumber. Mark, we just talked about this. Like none of us have formal clothing anymore, so we can't we can't get too fancy on this. I don't have any fancy clothes. 
Uh, I'll you, know, you don't have one suit? Close to you guys. <laughs> I, have I don't have a. I have zero suits. Listen, just single. come, just come to the wedding dress, dress in land geek style. That's all you got to do. <laughs> All right, I, I, I've, got, I've got a question for Berta, though. Hey, it's my turn. What are you doing? I thought, I thought you asked him the question. Eric got a layup dumb question. I mean, I mean <laughs> Eric got a silly question. I mean, what about me? Oh, jeez. <laughs> the floor is yours. Oh, hey, thank you. So, Roberto, congratulations on retirement. Congratulations on engagement and wedding, okay? So, you took action. You took action getting married. You took action with, um, you, you know, with, with your land business. So other than just take action, there are people listening to this right now who are just getting going. What advice do you have for them? Not take action. What advice do you have for them that, that they can, that will help them be here on this call in their own retirement party? I don't know, in three months. No, I'm kidding. At some point in the future. That's a tough one. <laughs> That's what happens when you go last. <laughs> um, so aside from from taking action is the is the is the question, right? Yeah. Aside from just taking, and if you want that, you can have it. But essentially, like, I well, mean, no, I, I I I think I, I I got one. So so, and it comes back to to probably Tate's uh, Tate's question, and it's related in that. I mean, it's it's one thing to take action, but it's another thing to take focused action in the sense that you're not out dabbling with other stuff that's taking time and energy away from this specific business model. Uh, because, I mean, I'm sure that had I been doing, I, I don't know, whatever other mobile homes or something else, I, I during the same time I was doing this business, I don't think I would have gotten here as, as quickly as I wanted. Um, and, and so it's not just taking action, but it's, it's a focused action where you're just doing this, whatever time you have left from your normal day, uh, which mine was in the evenings, uh, to just do this business until it starts being something that you see yourself that you, you'll be able to retire one day uh, <laughs> from it. So I think that that's that that would be a uh, an advice that I would give. Awesome, thank you. I love it. I love it. All right, do I get a two part question then, Scott Todd? It, look, it's your it's your show. You do whatever you want, but all I wanted was my same equal status to Eric. So don't. <laughs> all right, fine, fine. Um, all right, so Roberto, I just want to know real quickly, what was your biggest fear in? in making that leap um in, in 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 just quitting your job if you got the security it's 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 a profession it's a it's a noble worthy profession i can only imagine the conversation you'd had with your parents and maria um her parents like <laughs> you know oh you're marrying this attorney let's go oh wait no he's quitting he's gonna be a, <laughs> gonna be a land investor yeah, well, I mean, and I and I think uh, the the fear. I mean, I'll be honest. I, I think I could have quote unquote retired uh, maybe six months a year ago, uh, and and kind of bootstrapped it a little bit more than that. Uh, but ever since I started the land business, and ever ever since I made that first sale, it was uh, I I kind of knew that at one point in the future it was going to be a decision to be made where I was going to leave the security of the eight to five, a, a check every two weeks, healthcare benefits, dental benefits. Uh, you know, that check is going in every week, every two weeks and it pays for the mortgage and it pays for the expenses. Uh, and, and I'd be lying if I said, I didn't still have a little bit of that anxiety that, you know, I just quit my job and I'm, I'm going to rely on this and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to build this even more, but, but it's just up to me. I mean, I, it's, it, it, just saying it out loud even gives me a little bit of anxiety in the sense that, you know, I've had a job for seven and a half years, the same job. Uh, it, it, it's hard to leave something so secure. 
But at the same time, it was a no brainer because I was able to build this whilst having that job. Imagine what I can build just doing this full time. And so uh, the fear, I think, is is always going to be there. And I don't shy away from it because I think it also lights the little fire of, hey, man, I mean, nothing's for sure in this world. And so you've got to keep pushing and keep making sales and keep buying land and just keep building on it uh, so that you never have to go back to the to the eight to five. And so uh, I, I think the fear is going to be there, but I, I, I think I, I've, I'm, I'll learn and I'm learning to, to embrace it a little bit. Yeah, Scott Bossman, has, has your fear ever, ever creep up with you? Because you're, um, you're, you're in a noble, worthy profession as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, every once in a while, I think, uh, I mean, I, I miss it, honestly. So, you know, I, I spent 20 years of my life in healthcare, and uh, some days I wake up and I, I miss uh, working with patients. But then I start thinking about it. I'm like, I don't miss working with them 40 hours a week. I, I'd gladly go in for an afternoon here or there and keep up my skills and uh, continue to serve in that regard. So I still have the, you know, the luxury of being able to dabble in it a little bit here and there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fearful thing handing in that work badge and, and stepping out the door on your, you know, on your own knowing that, uh, hey, I don't have, you know, I don't have a healthcare plan in place. I don't have a retirement plan in place. I don't have all this stuff in place that's always been there for me for 20 years. Now it's on me. But like Roberto says, uh, you know, you, you spend focus energy on that stuff. You get that stuff set up and then you get all those things off your plate. And now I walk around the house and I'm like, I feel like uh, I need to find something more to do. Like, <laughs> I, mean, I need to like join the Habitat for Humanity or that type of thing. And those are the conversations I'm having now, which is really cool to think about, hey, I could take a day out of my life and just go volunteer somewhere. So that's kind of my next next phase and things, I think. Yeah, I do, I do feel like it's a good point, Scott. I do feel like, you know, when you get to Roberto's, you know, point in life, it is an, an existential threat. Like, okay, I can work anywhere I want with whomever I want, whenever I want, and I can do whatever I want in life. I'm totally free. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. It's, it is a new, I'd say the, uh, the best problem to have, yet it's still a problem. So um, it's, you know, so Roberto, do you know what you want to do besides <laughs> travel? Well, for now it's traveling right now. Uh, okay. it, it, it's always been kind of the, uh, and, and it's, it's strange because when Maria is like, well, are you sure we're okay doing this? I'm like, we, I sacrificed part of our time in our relationship during the last three years. And we were both on board and it was like, look, after work, you can't necessarily see each other every day. Cause I got this business. She was all on board with it. And I'm telling you, well, now we're just reaping the, the fruits of, of the time that we spent away. And I, we were building this business together and time to enjoy a little bit. We'll come back and we'll keep building it more. But right now it's a little bit of time to, to relax. I don't know what I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to feel when I'm six weeks into a two week, two month vacation. I'm going to maybe go crazy or something. I don't know. I'll, I'll deal with that problem when I get to it. I'm taking my laptop in case I want to work a lot uh but but yeah it's uh right now that's that's what we want to do and and we'll see what what comes up next in terms of of what we want to do all right i have one more question all right knowing what you know now is there anything you would have gone back and changed or would you get what what advice would retired roberto have given newbie roberto about the land business Well, I mean, I don't know if that it's the best answer, but retired Roberto would have wanted UB Roberto to be more organized uh, in in starting the business. I mean, it became like throughout halfway through the business, it was chaos, paperwork everywhere, uh, not knowing what I was going to have to pay in taxes. Uh, it was just kind of a, a, a whole mess. And I, I probably would advise him to, 
to spend a little bit more time in trying to organize because that will save a lot of time uh, later on and some headaches. Uh, but I mean, I, I wish I could tell newbie Roberto to learn about the business three years before he learned about it. Uh, but I guess I can't change that. <laughs> but that would be the advice that I've learned about this. I hear about all these students that are like 18, 19, 20, 21. And I'm so envious. I'm like, gosh, darn, I wish I would have started this business when I was 20 years old. But OK, so it's OK. Uh, I'm happy. <laughs> No, it's, it's great. It's great. Well, I, I think this is a phenomenal roundtable podcast, but of course we're now at that point in the podcast where we're going to ask Roberto for his tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actual. And I think your mentorship has been incredible and we're so, so excited for you in your future. But one more little nugget of advice for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives out. Before you tell us, I'm going to give you a little bit more time to think about it because we had to talk about our sponsor, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing with Scott Todd as your Sherpa. June 30th is the next class. Schedule a call with the Zen Master, Mike Zeno, Dude Buddy Night at Cap OG, Scott Bossman, and see if this is right for you, but I can tell you that that tuition ain't going to cost you nothing. You're going to make it back guaranteed in writing 180 days or less cash or terms deals. Just show us your work. So learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training, landgeek.com forward slash training. Roberto Chavez, Roberto retired Chavez. What is your tip of the week? Uh, so... I figured I would be put on the spot having heard the podcast. Uh, so I did come prepared, uh, <laughs> knowing that I would be the one giving the tip. And I did think about it and I was trying to think what would be the best tip that I could give. And, you know, I mean, the business is comprised basically of buying land and selling land. And I, I personally believe that selling land should be the last thing you try to um, delegate or hire people to do. Uh, and so well, we have a technical glitch with Roberto. Well, isn't that convenient? That was like that, the best tip was about to come out there. <laughs> he, he's not really stuck. He, he's just real still right now. <laughs> no, wait, he's back. He's back. <laughs> wait, 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 is selling. selling it would be selling and so uh what helped me kind of because i read this book that i'm about to tell you probably a year into my land business and kind of using the skills and the tips that were in this book really really helped me make more sales and be able to talk to people more because that's a skill that i really didn't have i mean i was more of a bookworm uh, studying in law school and then in a law firm, you don't really talk to people and try to sell something. So the tip is never, never split the difference. Um, by Chris Voss, it's really, really, really good. And I think anybody who's in the land business should read it. I think it'll help them improve their, their negotiation skills, uh, especially when it comes to. Well, both. I mean, I guess when you're buying land, it, it'll help. But for me, it helped me a lot more when, when I was trying to, trying to sell land. I love it. I'm going to have to revisit that book now because I, I think when I listened to it, it was maybe a year, year and a half ago. Um, I think, Scott Todd, you, you took the master class, right? No. You read the book. I read the book. I think I recommended the book. You did recommend the book. On the deal, uh, the tip of the week. On the tip of the week. I did not do the master class. I don't know who took the master, but the master class is on masterclass.com, right? It is on masterclass.com. I'm pretty sure, and I'm, I'm going to put on my DJ voice now. I'm pretty sure, Scott Todd, that you told me you were taking the master class. I think so. That's an inside joke for everybody that's read the book. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I told you that. I'm pretty sure you did. Can you prove it? 
Nope. Matt I Forbes, can't. Matt Forbes may have taken that. Maybe it was Matt Forbes. See? I don't know. Well, you know what? Look, it's nice because I'm going to remember this day because uh, I haven't been wrong in like three years. <laughs> so good, good on me. Um, are, does, are there any final words of encouragement, advice for Roberto before we end this epic retirement party roundtable podcast? All right. That's a wrap. That wraps up our top three roundtable episodes from 2021. Today's sponsor, as you know, is always Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing quickly, safely, efficiently with Scott Todd, who's done thousands of deals as your Flight School Sherpa. And that Flight School tuition, yeah, it's not going to cost you anything guaranteed. Just follow the program, show us your work, you will make back your tuition investment 180 days or less guaranteed. Learn more, just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training, thelandgeek.com forward slash training, and it's the best way to start 2022. If you're getting value for the podcast, please, my fragile, my, my ego is fragile. So just do us three little favors. All you've got to do is follow, rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review. Support at thelandgeek.com. I'm going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. So please do it. And we'll see you all next time. Let freedom ring. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.